Hello, I'm Gretchen Rubin, host of the Happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast, and today I'm going to be joined by Laura Vanderkam, a time use and work expert. Um, so I am coming to you live from my living room in New York City. Please tell me in the comments where are you watching from while we're waiting for Laura to join. Um, and if you have any questions for Laura, put them in the comments. This is your time to ask questions about the use of time, productivity, creativity, work, working from home during this time. Um, and so you know a little bit about Laura while we're waiting for her to join. Laura um, is the author of many best-selling books, including Off the Clock, um, 168 Hours, Why You Have More Time Than You Think. I love that subtitle. Um, what the most successful people do before breakfast. I know how she does it. Um, Juliet's School of Possibilities, a novel that she just published. Not only that, she's a podcaster. She is co-host of the Best of Both Worlds podcast. She has the podcast Before Breakfast and the New Corner Office. And if that is not enough to keep her out of mischief, she has five children, one of whom I believe is four months old, if I've been, uh, if I've been keeping track properly. So Laura Vanderkam, she writes about it, she speaks about it, she podcasts about it, and she lives it in her own life. Okay, let's get Laura Vanderkam with us. There she is. Okay. In the comments. Oh, waiting for her to join. This is always the exciting part, the suspense. There she is. Hey, hey how's it hey. going? Hey, it's going great. Um, how are you doing? Uh, how's your work from home going? It's going all right. <laughs> there are a lot of people here, yeah. um, but we are surviving. Um, uh, so, I yeah. I hear someone just said in the comments, I listened to her wonderful, her wonderful podcast. So that's great. Oh, um, good. So, Laura, the thing that I love about you um, and that I admire about your work is that it is so practical and you also, you live it. You have five kids, you write a ton, you travel a ton, you wrote a novel. Like, you're in a chorus when you can be, obviously. Right when now. I can be, can yes, be. sadly. Um, if you had to say one, and I know you're in a folder, um, like I am. Sure. So, um, and if you don't know if you're in a folder like Laura and I um, are, you can take the quiz at quiz.gretchenrubin.com. But if you could just tell people kind of like the one big idea about how to think about time and kind of getting things done during this, these difficult situations, is there like one or two key things that are like your big takeaways? Yeah, well, a time like this really requires us to be, you know, go fundamentalist on time management. Yeah. I mean, there, there are so many demands on our time right now. I know a lot of your readers and listeners and viewers are in the same boat of having kids at home, trying to work, homeschool the kids, dealing with our own sort of anxiety about what's going on in the world as well. So a lot going on. Time, as always, is better when you are intentional about it. Yeah. And that is the number one tip. Uh, I'd say that if all was going well in the world, <laughs> I say it now when, when things yeah. are not. Um, because if you don't think about how you're going to spend your time, well, time will keep passing. That's what it does. Yeah. It keeps getting away from us. And so if we don't think about how we want to spend it, we spend it mindlessly. We spend it on things that do not matter to us, but that are not important to ourselves or the people we care about. But if you do take a little bit of time to think about what you'd like to do with your time, well, you massively increase the chances that time is spent well. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, time is all we have. Um, and yet it's very easy to sort of take it for granted and let it just slip by. Um, one of the things you're a big, you're, you're a big um, proponent of time tracking. Um, so talk a little bit about time track. Now, I have to say, in truthful honesty, maybe it's my law training. I could you not haven't done it. it just, <laughs> I mean, I could not do it. And I'm, I'm still to this day, like, I can't do it. But I know from from talking to you that many people have found this like a transformative practice. Yes. Well, it's the, it's the same thing that, you know, if people are trying to watch what they eat, if they're trying to get out of yeah. debt, you want to know how these resources are being used. And so it's the same thing with time. You want to know where the time goes. Um, because if you don't know where the time is going now, how are you going to know what needs to change? Right. Uh, what often happens for people is that something they thought was a problem really isn't. Ooh, and like maybe what? something they've never considered is a much bigger part of their lives than they thought. Well, you know, people have certain stories we tell ourselves. I mean, a big one is that I work all the time, right? That's, that's my problem. I'm working all the time. And maybe you track your time and say, well, actually, the number of hours is within a reasonable amount. It's just that I find it really draining. Right. And so it seems much longer. 
And well, then we say, well, why is that? Let's, let's look at that and solve that problem. Um, it's not the hours per se. It's, it's what's happening within those hours. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people who are working and raising children think maybe they're not spending enough time with their family. And enough is a hard thing to say. Well, what does right. that even mean? Yeah. But when people track their time, they say, well, actually, I'm with these people a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. maybe the problem, again, is not the hours. It's what yeah. I'm doing with them. Right. So that's what we need to look at. Now, someone said, if I'm going to start reading your books, what should I start with? And someone else said, I'd recommend 168 hours to start, then off the clock. Do you agree with this, this clear fan <laughs> yes. of yours? About uh, well, clear. Hours? I mean, that's, that sounds like a good starting point. Uh, you know, I, so I, I, people ask me, which is my favorite book? It's like, which is my favorite child? I don't, yeah. I don't know. I like all of them. But, yeah. uh, you know, 168 hours is a good place to start because that was the first book I wrote about time management. Yeah. So I sort of spelled out my philosophy on it. Yeah. And then all these subsequent ones have a slightly different angle. Yeah. On, on how we spend our time. So sure, I think 168 hours is good and off the clock is like the graduate level class. See, that's how I feel about the happiness project. That was like my overview where I was sort of wrapping my hands around the whole thing. And then you start seeing like, this is the area where let's focus on habits or let's focus on the home. It's like, you, then you start seeing like what the big themes are. Um, someone says, oh, I'm surprised you aren't a track regression. <laughs> I'm not, but I still really benefit from Moore's other work. I don't know. I feel like I would love it, but I have to say every time I've tried it, I just can't do it. And I know a lot of people who have billable hours really don't like doing billable hours. Um, I think questioners probably would like it because they love tracking and hacking and, and kind of information gathering. And I think it is interesting. I think, it, I think, I mean, at least from reading your stuff and talking to people who, who have done time tracking, that people often do have a, an inaccurate picture of like what the big, t like you might think I spend hours commuting and it's like, well, you spend 45 minutes a day commuting, which is a lot, but it's not hours. Yeah. It feels like hours, but like sometimes, or like it takes, I spend, you know, 45 minutes taking a shower. It's like, no, you take like 22 minutes. It's like, <laughs> okay. You know, just being accurate is a help. Um, it is a help. Yeah. And because sometimes you find that something that's been building up really big in your mind is, is just not as big a deal as you thought. Yeah. And, and then you can decide, well, you know, I still may not want it in my life and that's yeah. fine, but yeah. it may be something you can keep in perspective too. And I know a lot of people, you know, I tell them there are 168 hours in a week and first, you know, like, well, I don't have any free time whatsoever. And then they start going through the numbers and it's like, well, you know, working 40. Okay. Well, yes, there must be time outside 40, but I commute a lot too. And so you add that on, even if it's 10 plus hours a week, we still have more time than that. Yeah. It's like, well, Maybe there is some time there. It's not as much as we want, right. but it's some. Well, do you think that one of the things that's been really kind of interesting about this time, I mean, it's, this is an experiment that none of us would have chosen and that none of us would want to happen, but it, it, it is happening, is that I think, I think it, it has startled people to all of a sudden be confronted with kind of like massive home-centered time. Mm -hmm. And like in your in your observation are you sort of glean is anything kind of struck you about how people are responding to it or like what you would have thought or wouldn't have thought or is anything kind of popping out at you because it is like this crazy time experiment that we're all part of yeah well I think the first thing is that people's experience of this is very very different so like <laughs> it's so like it's hard to generalize it's yeah. hard to generalize because Somebody who is, let's say, got two preschool aged children who are home from daycare and they're trying to still do a full time job remotely while managing their care is going to have a very different experience than somebody who, you know, is, is working remotely for the first time. Sure. But there's not that much outside of that, um, that they don't have particular caregiving responsibilities. And so all of a sudden there's all this open time because you can't go to the gym or go hang out with friends or go volunteer or anything like that. So, so those people are experiencing it in such different ways. Yeah. Um, I think everybody is, as you said, having this home, you know, so much time at home, you start to think about your time that what can I do at home? I mean, you, we're rediscovering certain leisure pursuits that have kind of fallen by the wayside over the years, whether that's board games or puzzles or, woodworking or other such making hobbies bread making bread uh, yeah. you know my kids oh. and I are doing lego projects like yeah. huge ones um, yeah so if you're if you're watching in the comments say like have there been any home pursuits 
that you found yourself starting to do uh, much more or for the first time ever. Um, yeah, like th there's just, we started playing Ticket to Ride game. Like this is just, I, I'm not a huge fan of board games, but it's like, okay, I'm in, I'll play. <laughs> I've got to play something. You got to do yeah, something. Some, yes. Well, well it's, we got to fill time it. with something, right? Yeah. It's that in the past we would have, you know, even those of us with young children would have been driving them places. Yeah. There's you know, swim lessons, there's scouts, there's whatever else. And when we don't have anything on the calendar other than being home, you, you know, going into a weekend, like, well, how do we fill this time? And so there's all these home-based pursuits and they're different for different ages. But yeah, you know, that's definitely been, I'm seeing a lot more board games on people's time logs than I ever would have seen in the past. Yeah. People are saying puzzles, creating videos, organizing pictures, finally. Oh, my gosh. Give us a thumbs up if you're haunted by your un, your un, like, dealt with photographs. I feel like this is something <laughs> that is, like, weighs on so many people's minds. Baking more, swimming more, more board games, walking the neighborhood, Instagram lives, knitting, sourdough bread, drawing doodles, puzzles. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that people, and it, it just, it, it, it is interesting that in a way we're all going through this together and in a way people's experiences are so vastly different. If you're an essential worker, if you've lost your job, if you're wor worried that you're gonna lose your job, if, you're, if your job basically is the same, um, if you spend all your day on Zoom. Um, yeah, I mean, you're a work thing. Do you have any tips for making like Zoom more like- <laughs> uh, More bearable? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's- well, I mean, every, it, it's Zoom concentrates the stuff that is bad about meetings anyway, yeah, yeah. right? So every meeting needs to be tightly planned, that if you're asking people yes. to gather, you need to think about what everyone in that gathering is doing with every minute that they are there. And if you don't know, then maybe that person doesn't need to be there, right? right. Every meeting has to have something that changes in the world as a result of the meeting having happened. And if nothing is going to change, you don't need that meeting. Now, Zoom has the unique aspects of being hard to read, you know, people's responses if it's slightly delayed. Um, yeah. People can't really speak on top of each other that easily. Um, so they need to be better facilitated than your average in-person meeting. You need somebody yeah. absolutely, like, dictatorially in control who is calling on people to speak. So it's not just like, does anyone have any comments? It's Gretchen, I would like your comments on this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now Joe, I want your comments on this. So a friend of mine, a friend of mine who's writing a book, uh, who's writing a book um, about sort of work and equity at work, and you know, men and women at work. Her thing is, she thinks that Zoom should have a feature where you could, at the end, and you, this is monitoring Laura, so um, you would see what percentage of the time each person spoke, Ooh, because she thinks just knowing, like, if one person knew that they spoke forty-five percent of the time or that this person spoke 0% of the time, it would make people more aware of exactly what you're saying, which is, this is something which maybe actually could be better um, in that it would, um, it would allow us to be, again, back to your idea of, of purposefulness, more purposeful about bringing people in. And there was a fascinating article in the Wall Street Journal about how Justice Thomas, who historically has spoken almost not at all during oral argument, he's, very well, he's like sort of known for not talking at oral argument, is that he's spoken more in the last period than he has in his whole history on the bench. And the speculation was it's because of the nature of Zoom and mm -hmm. the way they speak in seniority instead of just piping up, that that kind of suits, suited his nature more. Um, and so it is really interesting how these different tools, for some people they could be better, for some people they could be worse, but we can try to use them as best we can and take advantage of whatever they offer. Yeah. And certainly something like that would you know, be great to know. And you could probably find that out with something like Zoom. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in a meeting, you just have a general sense that, yeah, Joe's been talking a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this, you'd be like, you'd actually see. And if you were the one moderating it, like you say, you'd say, oh, I did a good job or I need to have, I need to like work harder if I want to bring everybody in. Because if I think I'm right that the research shows that teams do uh, produce more uh, higher quality work when there is a more when when it's when everyone sort of participates equally rather than when it's dominated by like kind of a couple stars or a couple sort of big mouths isn't that isn't yeah that, yeah well if you're not going to have everyone inputting I mean why is the person even on your team I mean there's right. there's no point having just spectators there yeah. I mean this is well it's not a performance <laughs> you know right. if you if you're bringing people into a meeting it's because you want them to contribute something and so if you're set up is not conducive to people contributing something, then you need to change your setup. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, if you feel like people, I think some people are, especially now, kind of stalling out or kind of feeling like there was sort of this adrenaline rush at the beginning and then you kind of settled in and now it's kind of like, oh, okay, now it's like starting to be the summer um, and we're still dealing with all these things. And again, in such different ways and in different parts of the country and different parts of the world and it's all, but like if people need to sort of give themselves kind of a kick in the pants, was there, do you have any thoughts about how to kind of re- give yourself a push down the hill. Yeah. Well, so I just created what I call a summer fun list. Uh, and I do this every summer. I choose about a dozen things that I want to do over the summer. Uh, usually it's things that are very seasonal that make summer feel like summer to oh. me. So it's, you know, I want to get ice cream at a certain ice cream parlor by the beach. I want to, you know, often I have picking strawberries on it. I don't think that'll happen this year for a few reasons, but it, that, all these things that are on the list that make summer feel like summer. And so I just produced one for this year. It's a little different than in past years, but there's still things that I can do, um, like taking the kids on hikes, um, do, you know, a day that I go bike, swim, and run in the same day, uh, you know, doing these certain Lego projects with my kids. I want to build a dollhouse with my daughter. So I make the list, and I encourage other people to make such a list too, because then over the next few months, as you're looking for something to keep your motivation up, to make it feel like life is still fun, well, you can pull stuff off this list and right. you can celebrate having done it. You can put it on your calendar and look forward to it. And, you know, as hopefully things start getting better, I, I do hope they will, um, that will add just an extra sense of like, well, I'm not wasting this time. I'm actually enjoying you know, the time I have with my family. But now I'd be curious, listeners, if you have ideas of like what, what makes summer summer to you and what do you think, that, what do you really want to get done this summer to make sure that it has that summer feeling, put it in the comments. Because I think a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh, I would love to do that too. Or that sounds like fun. Like um, when I visit my family, my parents in Kansas City, we always have a picnic. Um, we go to Winstead's, which is our favorite diner. We get takeout and then we have a picnic. They live in an apartment building, but it has this beautiful backyard. And it's like, that's one of the things, it's always super, super hot. You can hear like the crickets going. There's like, it just, there's something about it that to me is like, it's not summer if I haven't had like the, the Winstead picnic mm -hmm. in August in Kansas City. Um, and yeah, and like, and I think even it's interesting that you make this list. It's probably fun to look back over the years at different lists and like as your children have, have gotten older, you have more children. <laughs> Uh, you got more children all the time, Laura. Just keeps um, happening. <laughs> you know, it's like you can do certain things and, and like what people are interested in. It's probably like a little time capsule. Yeah, no. And I've, I mean, this is the good thing about blogging is I have them up from previous yeah. years. And so we often link oh, yeah. to them or my little widget at the bottom will automatically yeah. cough up the past yeah. years. Uh, so yeah, I can look and see, you know, we've, we've been eating at that ice cream parlor on the Jersey shore many a year and it's still really good. Uh, somebody says like, oh, summer beach reads, family trips to the beach and water parks. Oh, someone says get AirPods. That feels like something that could happen. Home <laughs> I can cream. put that on the list. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people saying barbecue. Um, yeah, barbecue is very is very summery. Um, uh, yeah, lots of a lot of ice cream. Oh, usually it would be summer concerts. Looking for alternatives. Yeah, I think. Oh, someone says reading rereading Harry Potter makes it feel like summer. Okay. Oh. Public service announcement, J.K. Rowling just announced that she is releasing a standalone children's book online. The first two mm. chapters are up, and I have been exercising extraordinary self-control, <laughs> and I have not read them yet, because I just found out today, and I have all this stuff I have to do, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that. Yeah, so something like rereading a favorite book or something. I know you love to read, Laura. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, and my kids are reading Harry Potter, so that's uh, <laughs> even better. There you go. So what here, last thing I want to ask you about, Laura, so... You, you speak a lot, you write all this nonfiction, you have these podcasts and you have sort of your, your subject. And then you wrote a novel and I know you've written other novels. Did you, how did you think about the time that you spent writing the novel? Um, did it feel like a different kind of time? How did you make time for it? Um, how did you view it? Did you view it just like a work product like any other work product or was it like special? Well, it was a little different. I mean, it was, so this, this book that the novel, I think you're talking about Juliet's School of Possibilities, yeah. which came out last year. It was through my same publisher who's done my nonfiction and it has a theme of time. Um, so in that sense, it wasn't totally different from doing any of my other books because I worked with the same people. Um, but it was definitely different writing it that yeah. instead of, 
you know, finding research and doing a time diary study and calling up people. I was just sitting there writing. Yeah. Um, but I actually decided to write the draft of it during, um, for the most part, during National Novel Writing Month. I decided yeah. that that was going to be a good way to, I love a project. You love a project. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's yeah. a good way to hey, get it done. Give us a thumbs up if you've done National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo, or National Screenplay Writing Month, or Comic Writing Month. There's a whole bunch of them. Because I did it too. I did, I did it as well. Yeah. And I thought that was a really good strategy for me because it, you know, because it was different writing, it meant that I was just going to do it. Yeah. And then I could spend as much time as I needed going back and, and making it better. But in order to get over that sort of, am I doing this right? Yeah. I just write and I guess I'll figure it out at the end. And did you just do it as part of your, your work day or did you like add special time for it? Or it was during yeah, the fun. So did I pretty much did it as part of the work day. I mean, yeah. the, the issue with, five kids is that you can't be too precious about when you work. <laughs> I mean, it's got to happen when it's got to happen. Yeah. Um, and so when they're all at school or the babysitter's got the little ones sit down. Right. Right. Um, and that, I mean, as an upholder in a way that comes easily, but in a way it's hard because it's hard. It can be hard to be flexible as an upholder. Or like you can get very uneasy if you don't get done what you plan to get done at a certain time. Well, um, that is true. Yeah. But, uh, there's good things and bad things about all of our tendencies. There, are exactly. If someone says, I'm going to work on my novel. Okay, there you go. Uh, a lot of, yeah, people have, I see people did the National Novel Writing Month. If you're just joining, I'm Gretchen Rubin of the Happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast. This is Laura Vanderkam of, I mean, what, yeah, say all three of your podcasts. Um, so I have two that are short every morning tips. One's called yeah. Before Breakfast. Yes. And one is called The New Corner Office, which is tips about working from home. So if anyone's experiencing that for the first time, you might enjoy listening to that. And then another that I co-host is Sarah Hart Unger called Best of Both Worlds, which is about combining work and family. Okay, so last question for you, Laura. Do you have any, like, quick hacks? Like, use a headset when you're on the phone or use three monitors. That's my favorite hack. Or <laughs> three three monitors, three. wow. I love it. It's like the greatest thing of all time. Um, I thought it would be terrible. I love it. Do you have any like things that you're like, oh my gosh, this is, this makes working from home. So this, this really helps me with my productivity work, work. Well, I mean, it's the same thing that I do would recommend people do from an office too, but it's having one designated weekly planning time. Um, I love Friday afternoons. If you take 15 minutes on Friday afternoon and do two things, one is think about what do I need to do next week? like, or want to do next week, both professionally and personally, what are my sort of top goals, priorities, things that I have to do, whatever, list it all, get it in your head, get it on your calendar. And then also look at your calendar for the next week. And ask yourself, like, what do I not want to do? <laughs> like, what can I make smaller? What yeah. can I give to somebody else? Yeah. And in literally 15 minutes, you will not only have a great upcoming week because you're clear on what has to happen and what you would like to see happen. You will also have potentially bought yourself hours by getting that hour long meeting down to a five minute phone call uh, or oh. sending somebody else who would yes. be better suited to something. I, you know, you can buy yourself hours in a few minutes. So definitely right. do it. Well, the whole thing of like, can we do this by email instead of like setting up a time and getting on the phone and then chit chat, chit chat, and then one little nugget and then chit chat, chit chat. Yes. Yeah. Um, that is a great suggestion. Laura, thank you so much. Um, for people who want to follow up, uh, tell them how they can read more about all your stuff or listen to you. Um, where can they find? Um, I, I'm a huge fan of your work, as you know. Oh, thank you. I first read 100, uh, 168 hours. Yeah. So, yeah, come visit my website, lauravandercam.com. I, I blog, you know, three or four times a week. Uh, if people are on Instagram here, I'm at lvandercam. So please come find me there. Excellent. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, everybody, let's keep our hands clean and our minds clear. See, I'll talk to you on Friday with Elizabeth. Bye. Thank you.